Good morning, Calvary family. Today is a family worship Sunday, so kids will be staying in the worship service the whole time, worshiping with their family. No children's church today. But kids' activity bags can be found in the front lobby. Look for the black boxes. And this Wednesday for Awana is our Love Your Leader Night. So the Awana leaders, they've invested a lot of time and energy into the Awana kids. So let's shower them with thank you cards, goodies, and gifts. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. Come on. Linda, I told you not to be skateboarding. I know, but it looks so much fun. <laughs> Happy Good morning, Easter. everybody. Happy Easter. We got just a few quick, quick. few quick announcements this morning. Like one month from today is the retreat. Can you believe it? I know. I'm so excited. I can't wait to go. But listen, we need to know who's going to sign up to drive with me on the bus. If you're a daredevil, if you live life on the wild side, you want to ride with me on the bus. So sign up on the women's table. And also next Sunday, we're having our usual sisterhood. It's going to be 6 o'clock here at the church. We're going to be honoring Skylark. So if you can bring some gender neutral baby items that we can bless these uh, ladies with. And also we're gonna have Paige Popple speaking. So that should be a good time. Yeah, we'll have a lot of fun. So bring your baby shower stuff and we'll see you next Sunday here at the Fellowship Hall, right? Exactly. Happy and y'all have a happy Easter.
you would stand with us. Sing along as them kids did. Here we go. All hail King Jesus. He's alive. Lord, we do thank you for sending your son to do something that we couldn't do ourselves. We thank you for being that perfect sacrifice so that our sins can be forgiven. Lord, we want to glorify you and praise you today for what you've done. What a magnificent thing. And we want to lift you up in every way we could possibly do it. We pray that this day will be a great celebration of your resurrection. We pray this and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Do want to welcome everybody here. For all those who, who haven't been here in a while and all those new guests, we appreciate this. We've got a good full crowd. Do want to have a couple of announcements. First of all, our Annie Armstrong offering, we do have that going on, and our goal has not been reached yet. In fact, according to last week, we're not even halfway there. So make sure you give to the Annie Armstrong. This goes to our North American Mission Fund to send missionaries out into our, our own area. So this is a great way to spread the love of Christ. Also want to mention... Tomorrow night, tomorrow night is our Baptist men. So if you're going to be going to Baptist men at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall, it is a wonderful time for men to get together, fellowship, have some really good food, and learn of other mission projects that are going on within our region. So with all that in mind, are you all ready to fellowship with each other? 
Well, let's extend a great warm hand to each other, and let's fellowship. If you would come back together with us, be seated. What a great day to have baptism, especially baptism of children. So if you would come back together. Just in case, sometimes, sometimes when you get up there doing stuff, you forget something that you want to say, but just in case, Brother Pete, or they forget, if you're, if you're here today, for a baptism and you're part of the family or friends or whatever, when your person comes up, if you would stand during that time. Brother Pete. You know, you know can y'all hear me okay? You can? Jesus is alive! But as we discussed in the first message today, my friends, you cannot be resurrected with Jesus until you die first. And I have three people who want to tell the world that they have died to themselves and they have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ. Our first brand new Christian is Bristol Mitchum. Bristol, come on down. Come on down, little girl. Amen. Uh, as you saw on her shirt, it reads, I'm all in. Well, guess what? You're all in. There's nowhere to go. Bristol has been coming to our church off and on for a long time now, right? Br Bristol, with your mother, your grandparents. Uh, people have been praying for you for a long time. Your, your, your staff has been praying for you as well. We have so many children who come each week, and they're brought just a little bit closer to the cross. And... The answer to our prayers is that you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. She knows where she's going when her life comes to an end. Because she's not trusting baptism, she's trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to cover her sin. Bristol, we are so proud of you. And as Brother Bruce said, if you are a friend or a relative of this sweet child, if you will stand and rise with her in, in support of her. You ready, Bristol? Let's show the world that you belong to the Lord. Bristol. Upon your profession of faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. For you have been buried with him in death, and you are now raised to walk in newness of life. Congrats, Bristol. Love you. And our next new believer is Riley Kirkland. Come on down, little Riley. Sweet baby. Got it. What's your name? Riley Kirkland. Why do you need to say that? Because I'm going to pray for you soon. Why did you accept Jesus into your heart? Because he's good and powerful. 
how will we serve Christ? That's our mother. Uh, Riley was like, Dad, those are the easy questions. Give me something hard. <laughs> Is it the sovereignty of God or free will? Are you ready to an answer that question, Riley? No, okay, good. Nor, nor am I. <laughs> Riley is another young child. Let me tell you now, her mom and dad. Now, Riley, if you do not know her story, Riley was a sick little girl for a long time. But you know what? Even though she was sick and her mom and dad did not know exact, exactly what was wrong with her and how to heal her, Jesus had you in the palm of his hands. Isn't that beautiful, Riley? That no matter what you were going through and your mom and dad and your family, you were always loved and you still are. And Riley has responded to the love of God. Now, I know that she looks like she's about two, two years old, but she is not. She has been raised in the faith. She knows what sin is. She knows that she's going to die one day because of sin. And she knows that this water does not save her but the blood of Jesus Christ. And she has shared with me over a year ago. And let me tell you, she knows the plan of salvation. She knows the man of salvation. Oh, if all people would come at a young age, Riley, the younger you come, the less sin there is to repent of and the more days to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. Riley, we're so proud of you. If you're a relative or friend of hers, would you please stand? Riley, upon your profession of faith on our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. For you have been buried with him in death. Now you are raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations, darling. Congrats. And our last new believer is Adelaide Wimmer, who will be baptized by her father. All right, Adelaide, so what is part of the story of how you decided to become a Christian? Part of it is um, when I went to the hospital and thousands and thousands of people were praying for me. And also part of it is I've been asking God tons of questions and asking people tons of questions. How do you become a Christian? How do you do this? How do you do all of these things to become a Christian? And at the end of it, when, they, when the God said, if you did this prayer tonight and you want to make that decision, please come to Mr. Barry. And I knew it was the right time to become a Christian. I know that I'm a Christian because I trust in God and also because I know Praying for her, especially the ordeal last year. Um, we, you guys came together as a church body for us and for her, and she knows that. She was talking about it back then a year ago, and uh, recently she came to that profession on her own. We didn't want to push her too far, <laughs> but our Sunday school teachers, her Awana teachers, and all of you were a huge instrumental part in bringing her to, to this profession of faith and now her wanting to get baptized and I'd ask if uh, any of you are friends out there if you wouldn't mind standing to support her we appreciate that and uh, you ready want to baptize all right sister in Christ I baptize you in the name of the father the, hun the son and the holy spirit <laughs> oh God. Buried with him in death. Just to walk a new life. Congratulations. Thank you.
was going to have a child and knew that life would never be the same. She laid that precious child in a manger all the while, crying out, Jesus is his name. And everyone around began to say, listen to that heartbeat, such a special heartbeat. Sounds like none I've ever heard at any other time. Listen to that heartbeat, such a different heartbeat. Every beat just seems to be the hope of all a man and with words of life began walking shores of Galilee that day he cleansed lives of their sins and the blind could see again the lame could walk the dumb could talk and everyone And the earth grew dark and still as they nailed him to a rugged tree. The blood came streaming down to a thirsty ground. The whole world hushed at his final. to the tomb, all their lives in ruin, in their hearts crying bitter tears. But everything had changed, the storm
you would stand with us. Here we go. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. be seated.
we go. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for the love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. You watched me in your crimson glow. Now all I know is your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. He was seated on the throne. We may be seated. Gates and doors are barred, and all the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow, half in fear of the day. To find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. Just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. I hurried to the window, looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. John stood there beside me as she told us where she'd been. She said they moved him in the night and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away and now his body isn't there. The boat ran toward the garden and then John ran on ahead. 
And we found the stone in the empty tomb, just the way that Mary said. But the winding sheet that wrapped him in was just an empty shell. And how well they taken him was more than I could tell. Well, something strange had happened there, just what I did not know. John believed a miracle, but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. Seen them crucify him, then I saw him die. Back inside the house again, the guilt and the anguish came. And everything I promised him just added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. And even if he were alive, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. A light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. And I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. He raised me to my feet. And as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Built to my confusion, disappeared in sweet release. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into me. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time the sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm 
You held me in your sight, so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside, but there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, and broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood of life thank you jesus who has washed me white thank you jesus you have saved tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walk right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end but i have been transformed by the blood Thank you. It's a wonderful job singing by our children, praise to him by our choir, even by you, Brother Bruce. You, you did okay. Are y'all ready to leave? Somebody is. <laughs> you know, in law school, they teach never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Maybe that's why I'm not a law student. I remember, and for some other reasons, <laughs> uh, 
I remember, it wasn't too long ago, I am 50, all right, Generation X here. But I do remember what it was like to be young, especially when you're hanging out at mom and, da- in mom and dad's house with the family come over, or going to go visit your grandparents in Eastman or in Hawkinsville. And we would take that trip down 25, 30 minutes, and all of us cousins would be outside in the yard, even at Easter time. And we'd go outside and we would play. And you know, especially at Easter time when the weather stinks half the time, and you're playing games outside, and then the weather is terrible. So what do the kids generally do? They bring the games inside. A hundred and plus years ago in Victoria, England, the rave across the upper class was all about playing lawn tennis. And you know that the weather is ter- terrible there. And, and soon after tennis takes off in Great Britain, you know, when the rain becomes terrible and you gotta go, have to go, go inside, guess what they did? They brought tennis inside the house. They would go into the library, clear off the biggest table that they could find, bring it out, and they would take library books that people pretended to read. And they would take the books and they would form a net in the middle of this table and they would grab a champagne cork and that, they would use that as a tennis ball and they would grab the biggest book that they can find and swing around and they play tennis on a table inside. And what game do we call that in America? Ping pong. Do you, and you probably think, how many churches in the world today are talking about ping pong on Easter? Maybe five or six. I don't know. It's not my message. I didn't steal it, at least not consciously. But do you know that a lot of us play ping pong? Maybe not with the table, but a lot of us play spiritual ping pong. People play spiritual ping pong back when Jesus rose again. You don't believe me? You say, Pete, show me the verse. If you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. I want to talk today about playing ping pong, but spiritual ping pong. And it happened when Jesus rose again. As our custom here is at Calvary Jessup, if you are able and willing to stand as we read the sacred scripture, let's look at just a few verses today in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is alive. He is worth our time, is he not? Let's see what the good book says. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now on the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the, what day of the week, church? That's why we're meeting on Sundays as a church, because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and he came and he rolled the stone and sat upon it. Notice that Jesus is nowhere to be found. Jesus was already risen and had already walked through that stone. All right, church? The angel did not let him out. He was already gone. Verse 3. And his appearance, the angel now, was like lightning. And his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him. He became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. Say this with me, church. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. And behold, (laughs) 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 if I were a cursed man, you would have heard it then. Just a little bit. I'm coming to meet you. <laughs> Woo. All right. <laughs> uh, he's going, he says, Jesus is going to meet you ahead in the Galilee. <laughs> now, there are some events that take place. Let's, let's drop on down to verse 16. But the eleven proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now, your Bible doesn't read this, but if you compare Scripture with Scripture, we all believe... Most of us believe that Jesus is in Galilee. He's meeting with 11, but a whole bunch more. Maybe up to 500 people at one time. So let me go back to verse 16. But the 11 proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Hallelujah, right? But look at this last part. But some were, say it church, doubtful. Verse 18. And Jesus came and he spoke to them. I'm going to stop there. Father God, I thank you. For this amazing word that we have. Oh, Lord, 
There are so many great, much better preachers than I could ever hope to be. But no one has a better gospel than what we're going to share together. Father God, light me on fire before these people consume me. But may they see your spirit. May they see the scripture and how it applies to their lives. Father God, change us through your word. Oh, may people not be distracted by noise and by time, but be focused on what you're doing in our midst. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, but also for being buried and resurrected. And if you're a child of God, would you say amen? amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Calvary Jessup, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. I, I pray that you have ears to hear today. I want to talk to you about playing ping pong. Imagine in this church today, we had two ping pong. We had a tournament going on in here, and there were two ping pong tables out. You know that there are some of us who would play on table two. I'll get to you last. And there are some people who play on table one. I'll take care of you first. And on this table, you have different sets of people competing. And let's look at the first table. Let's look at some centers. Do y'all know any centers in life? Let's look at table number one. This is where the centers play ping pong. And you know the two sides that they're playing here. And, and you're really not playing someone else. You're playing against yourself. You're over here with one pat, paddle hitting. And you run to the other table. And you hit it back. You go back and forth. And you know I'm going to label these two sides. One side of the table I'm going to call your head. And the other side I'm going to call that your heart. See the head speaks today in this first point. Of knowing the facts about the resurrection of Jesus. But the heart speaks of believing and trusting on him with everything you have and relying just on him. More people are on the head side than in the heart side. And I'll let God's spirit deal with you in your own heart and mind. Why do people doubt in their heads? Why does somebody look at this, the resurrection story in the head and say, this cannot be true? Because there are lots of people who doubt it. I mean, this Greek word for doubt means to go back and forth. That's the whole concept of playing ping pong or tennis. It's because they were believing, and then they weren't believing. They were believing, and then they were not believing. And then they didn't know how to live life, and they lived in their doubt, and their doubt became unbelief. And unbelief is what sends you to hell, not your doubt. But people who lived in unbelief lean on their heart way too much. Because think about this story. Think about it, guys. Think with me. This story is crazy. God becoming a man? That's crazy. God taking on flesh and becoming a sinner at the cross to stand in for me and for you? That's nuts. I'm an American. You get what you deserve. This is a crazy gospel that we have, church. It's crazy. And to think that a dead man gets up and walks out and walks through the stone and goes about his merry way to go see his dad and people he loves? That's crazy. That's the head talking. The head says, think of imagination. The head said, this story is nuts. This is a bunch of women. Women were not even allowed to testify in court then because you could not trust what a woman says. And who did Jesus reveal himself to first? Women. Who were the first bearers of the gospel? Women. He's alive. And people said, you're crazy because you're abroad. You're crazy because dead people don't get up and walk out and leave. That's what the head says. You're just saying that because you need a crutch to get by in life. At best, this is just wishful thinking. This cannot be true. But the head also thinks of explanations. These people who are there by, by the hundreds, we think, perhaps, in front of Jesus, and they see him up here on the mountaintop, and there's some people away, far away, and they go, I'm not seeing what I think I see. We're just hallucinating. It's really not him. It's just what's in our heads and our minds. Some people believe in something called now the swoon theory, that Jesus never was truly dead. When they took him off the cross, he still had life. And that's how he could get up and walk out and leave. Then there's some people who think it's the double theory. That that Jesus is not really him. It's somebody who looks just like him. After all, he looked like everybody else when he walked the earth. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Judas had to point him out by kissing him. Because he looked just like everybody else. He was just another Joe Blow Jew. Reminds me of 1966. When Paul McCartney of the Beatle fame. He was supposed to be dead. And, and in their songs and their lyrics, they talked about how Paul, this guy, Paul's dead. It's, it's, it's a fraud. It, it, it's a fall. It's a fake Paul. And this went out, and guess what? It helped sell records. It helped, helped sell records, Bruce. People think that about Jesus, that it's just somebody who looks like him and stepped into a role. Kind of like how some Americans believe we never landed on the moon. 
<laughs> it's all staged. It's all a production. That's what the head says. Some people think the body was stolen. You think about this, church. For the last 2,000 years, liberals and people who hate the gospel of Jesus Christ have been coming up with all these theories. They are no smarter than the people who lived in the first century. They may know more, but they're not smarter than. All these chief priests and Pharisees, they all got together and said, what excuse can we come up with? And they thought about all these things. But they said, you know, the only possible excuse could be that somebody took his body. That's it. Nothing else is even close to being a fault to rationalize the resurrection. And even they spread this because of lies. But the head also thinks of relaxation. Do you know to follow Jesus Christ? Do you know that it cost? Do you know that we are persecuted now? More and more in America? And you think Jesus is coming this week? My friend, things are going to get a lot worse. The persecution has only just begun. Are you ready? Some people say, I can't believe in the resurrection. It can't be true for me. I'm not willing to pay the price to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the head thinks of this. This is, this is where we get in America. The head thinks of substitution. I don't have to have faith in Jesus and lean on him and surrender to him. I can just believe the facts of the gospel. You ask the average American. When I grew up walking walk the streets, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus rose again the third day? Yes, I do. Lost as last year's Easter egg. Because they knew the facts in the head, but not in the heart. Because in the heart, you bend the knee. You changed. There's repentance, which is not being preached as much these days. Jesus spoke about those who sided on behalf of the head. People who would tip the cap to Jesus and then go about their merry way, but they would never bend the knee before the Lamb of God. Matthew chapter 7, he says, not everyone that says unto me, you know this pastor's church, Lord, Lord, not everybody will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Bruce, what does that say? That means that everybody's singing about heaven and going. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do we not even cast out demons and do perform many miracles? Jesus said, I, did, I will not tell you that I once knew you. I never knew you. Because they had a head faith but not a hard faith. That's why they play ping pong. I'm okay. I know the facts. But the question is, has your facts changed the way you live? Think about this church. There was false praying. These people who did the Lord's work prayed to the Lord. Oh, Lord. They did false preaching. They said, do we not prophesy? Do we not proclaim your truth? False power. Do we not cast out demons? There was a false performance as well. You can think of all the facts you know about God. But my friend, if it has not changed your heart, you are lost. And it's not my job to tell you. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Many Americans are on their way to hell. They have what we call a home plate problem. This is Wayne County still, right? You people love some baseball and softball now. Y'all are some baseball, softball loving folks. You know how wide home plate is? 17 inches. Do you know how far it is from your head to your heart? It's right at it. Some of us are going to miss heaven by the width of home plate. Every time you go to a ball game, some of you have grandchildren, children that are playing the rec league. Look at that home plate. Always think of that. People are going to miss heaven as far as the width of that plate. What's all the fuss about? Why, why, why do some people, some people hate the resurrection? Why is it that if it's just a myth like the Greeks had and the Romans had, why is it that the Christian faith is attacked so much? Can you tell me, church? Can you, you know why? I think it's very simple. Even in the beginning of Acts, do you know that the first church preached the resurrection over and over and over and over again? That's where it got them into trouble. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We went through Acts over the last year and a half, church. The, the people spoke to the apostles that were preaching. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 2, it reads this, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see, preaching resurrection truth, it is problematic. That's why so few churches are preaching the resurrection today, because it creates a problem. You say, well, Pete, where's the problem? Well, the problem is, lies in its confirmation. Do you know that if Jesus came out of that tomb, everything he said while walking the earth is true? Are you listening, church? If Jesus came, rose out of that grave, everything he said is right. 
And that's a problem for us in America today. Does America believe Jesus has risen? I will tell you no. You want some proof? Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong in America about relativism. There is an absolute truth, and there's only one of them. It's his truth. Your truth doesn't mean squat in heaven. We are choking on choice as a culture. We need Jesus. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong about humanism. We are not smart enough, and we are not good enough to fix ourselves. Not going to happen, Captain. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong in America about same-sex marriage. The Bible says man shall be joined unto his wife. Because Jesus is alive, you are wrong about living together. Man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto who? Not his girlfriend and not his fiance. With whom? His wife. I say that in love, church. If you have a problem with it, it's not with me. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong about divorce. What God has joined together, let no man separate. That's what my Bible reads. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong about transgender rights. Have you heard the latest from the White House? He's our president, whether you voted for him or not. Pray for that man to be saved. Today is transgender day of all days. 365 days. Guess which one he chose to make transgender day? Today, Mr. President, I know you're watching. <laughs> you are wrong, sir. May God change your heart. We love you. We pray for you to be saved, but you are wrong. And one day you will stand before God and judge the judgment. It's not too late to repent. The Bible says God created the male and female. Because Jesus is alive, we're wrong about materialism. He who dies with the most toys still dies, and the toys do not follow him or her. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong about racism. Jesus loves all the children of the world. Because Jesus is alive, we are wrong about abortion. Jesus said, let the children come unto me. All of them. All of our kids are not at the foot of the cross yet, church. Keep praying. We had three today. Wasn't that beautiful? All three of those beautiful girls. We got some more coming next week. Woo! There's room for more. Problem lies. I'm sorry, the resurrection is a problem for us in America because it confirms his teaching. The problem lies also in its conviction. Why did Jesus have to die in the first place? Because we are responsible because we put him there based on our sin. The problem lies in its condemnation. You need to write down Acts 17, 31. The resurrection seals not only... My eternity, but every person's eternity. Did you know that? Did you know that the resurrection of Jesus not only influences mine, because even though I'm saved and I know I'm going to live forever in Christ, do you know if you're lost, his resurrection seals your fate in eternity too? Are you listening, church? His resurrection is confirmation. He will judge the world. Why? How do we know that? God said, because I raised my son from the dead. That's why. I approve of him as the judge. That's why I raised him up. He's going to judge us all. Resurrection preaching is persecuted. You see the tool of it in the other parts of this chapter. I don't have time to go into that, but we know this. Resurrection preaching also is powerful. The church went from 120 people in Acts chapter 2 to within two decades over 100,000 people. Was that because of their charisma and their charm and their money and their position? No, they were a bunch of nobodies. Well, what was the change? What was the power? The cross and its resurrection of the dead. Do you know you cannot be saved without believing on the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah, but I believe in the Easter bunny and eggs. The Bible reads in Acts in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You have to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has what? Raised him from the dead. We memorized that last two weeks ago. I have some great news for us. We as Calvary Jessup have not been commanded to prove the resurrection, but to preach it. Let God do the rest. Well, here you go. You said the other thing. How can we tell when the heart is winning? How do I tell? Okay, tell me about the head. Tell me about the heart. What, is it, what does it mean to believe with the heart? What does that look like? Well, what happened in the resurrection story? What happened to these believers? 
Well, if you look throughout this chapter, you'll find that this heart believed with wonder. The Bible reads that the ladies, when they reach the angel and they hear about it, now they're going to bump into Jesus, but the whole time they're running around like their heads are chopped off. Not because they don't know where they're going, but because they're so excited. The Bible reads they had great fear mixed with great joy. And it wasn't fear that they're scared to death. They feared because they were in awe. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for being alive. Guys, there's something to be excited about. Do you have joy in your heart? Is there a wonder in your heart? Or did you lose it when, when you turned 12 years old? Or did you lose it when you left high school and you never came back to church? That'll preach, won't it? Or did you lose your wonder when you had your ease in life and you're just coasting? A heart that believes has wonder. And you don't have to scream and yell like a madman. But it helps. The heart believes with witnessing. The angel said, come and see. And then he said, go and tell. These ladies were telling everybody that they come across that he's alive. And even though they were not believed, did that stop them? Even though they told and people looked at them like they're crazy, did it stop them? No. God has not called you to fruitfulness, but to faithfulness. It's not your job to save people or, or to determine if they believe or not. That's on them and the Spirit of God. It's our job to be faithful. If you are believing with your heart, you are witnessing. And my friend, you're also worshiping. Oh, the Bible reads that when they saw Jesus, they fell at his feet and they worshiped him. And then it reads in our, our passage in verse 17 that when they were on that mountain, they were together worshiping. Church is important. You're going to make me say it. Okay, all right, they got it. All right. Amen. You worship in your heart, you worship in your home, you worship in your local church. For those of you who are visiting and guests, when you go home, be plugged into your local church. Have a heart that believes and worship with others. But the heart also believes it while waiting. The Bible reads that they said, go and wait on me. And that's what they did. I wonder, are we doing any waiting today on this side of glory? 2,000 years after the resurrection story, are we still waiting today? My redemption is not complete just yet. The Bible says I've already been glorified, ju justified. You read Romans 8. It's all in the past tense. But you know, until I'm in his presence, Bruce... I'm not completely, completely restored, but it's coming. And I'm waiting on him. When I see him, we will be raised together with him. We're already in the heavenly places positionally, but personally we will be in his presence. That is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I hope you're waiting. But also the heart believes with works. These people went out, and the, and the Great Commission is all about discipleship, it's about making people pursue the image of Christ. It's one thing to be baptized. One thing to have these decisions. What the church really needs to focus on is not just decisions. We need to focus on discipleship. And to be a disciple of Christ means you have to learn about Christ. And you have to worship like your worship is at the level of your knowledge in Christ. And you have accountability. Guys, we do this together. It is important to do the works of the Lord. At Calvary, yes, we want decisions, but we also want disciples. Sinner! Put your paddle down. Quit trusting, lean on the head. Use your heart. Believe in the scriptures. Quit playing this game. The reason people are lost is not because of their, of their head. Twice in the Psalms it reads, the fool has said there is no God. But where did he say it? Does it read the fool has said it in his mind? The Bible reads the fool has said it in his heart there is no God. We need a new heart. And God is the one who can give it to you. But you must surrender. Are you tired of me going over table one? Sinners, are you ready for me to get on to the saints now? Yes. Let's go to table two. That's where we are. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're playing on table two. And you have a paddle too, guys. Sorry. But we have a paddle as well. As I close, I want to look at two pe people that paddled. And the two sides are the side of the soul and the side of the spirit. 
And in the resurrection story, there were two disciples, two people who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were saved. They were from one table to the next. They, they did believe in, in time. But as the resurrection passes, they, day after day, they had two struggles. And one guy, the first player, is the apostle Thomas. See, Thomas was a man who was driven not by the Spirit of God, but he was driven by his soul. You see, Thomas was, was like most of us, well, like all of us. Well, I have a body, soul, and if you're saved, you have a spirit. Your soul is your personality. It's your sense of humor. It's your intellect. It's who you really are, how you express yourself. And inside of your soul is your will, your mind, and your emotions. Do you know any people who believe on Jesus that are driven by their soul? They live in their feelings rather than in faith. Thomas was a man Apart from the presence of Jesus Christ, he played ping pong too. Thomas, he's alive. We saw him. And Thomas, who was the first Christian to say, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church. Because he wasn't with the people when Jesus came. He was on his own. Mm, 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 mm. Thomas, we see him. You missed it. You missed church service. Jesus showed up and showed out. And what did Thomas say? Unless I see, unless I touch, I will not believe. That's a soulless person. Because that's all about feelings and about what you can touch. It was tangible, how you feel. And I'm afraid Thomas is not the only person in this building with the sound of my voice who is led by his or her soul on a daily basis. The Bible says to, to have faith. Faith is not positive thinking. It's not well wishes. Faith, according to Scripture, is listening to God speak. I agree, and walking according to what God has said. Thomas did not do that. God had given him so many passages in the scriptures, and Jesus even shared the scriptures with all of his disciples over and over again, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. Well, didn't he have the gospel in the New Testament? No, he was living in it. He had the Old Testament, though. He had the teachings of Jesus. But yet, when it came down to faith or feelings, guess what he chose? Guess what he chose? He chose feelings. You do not have to have all the answers in life to live by faith. But you do to be, to be based on feelings and to feel good about it. You do not have to agree with how all things happen and what goes down. But by faith, you can move on. What the scoreboard of life shows and how you're either ahead or tied or way behind that impacts how a lot of people live. My friend, people who are living according to faith and according to the Spirit do not look at earth's scoreboard because it's going to change. We already know the result. But this is how Thomas lived. Let me see, let me touch, let me feel, and that's when I'll come and worship. Your conviction should be much greater than your comfort in life because if you're going to use comfort to serve God, you're not going to serve Him very much. And when you are comfortable, you're going to forget about them. The last player is Peter. This is found in the book of John. Jesus has risen. He has revealed himself. Peter has seen him. Peter believes. He does not doubt that Jesus is alive. But you know what Peter, Peter does? Peter says, you know what? We're sitting around here. Let's go fishing. Now, why would Peter want to go, go fishing? Why? 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 What did he do for a living? He's a fisherman. He went back to doing his old way of life. Well, victory's been won. Jesus is alive. Everything's taken care of. I'm going back fishing again. Let's go, boys. And seven of them are out there fishing. And that's when Jesus comes to them. Whether you're Thomas, put the paddle down, live by faith. And here with Peter, I think there are two reasons why he goes back fishing. One is for relaxation. Everything's been taken care of. The victory is won. Jesus is alive. He will establish his messiahship soon. Now I can do what I want to do. The victory is won. Now I can do what I want to do. That's not what he's called to do, though. But it's comfortable. I think another reason why he goes fishing, not only is real for relaxation, but also for rejection. Wasn't it Peter who denied his Lord? One time. What about the second time? He did it again. What about the third time? Third time he started to curse and swear. Three times he betrayed his Lord. Three times. Oh, what a terrible follower he, he was. 
and he's dejected. He's dejected. But then the Bible says in Matthew 28, some were doubtful, but the Bible reads that Jesus came to them and spoke. To Thomas, what did he do to Thomas? Unless I see and feel and touch and handle. Jesus came to him and said, Thomas, here I am. And with Peter, he's doubting himself. He's down about the past mistakes. He's living in rejection. He's living in relaxation now. And the Bible reads that Jesus comes to him and speaks. Jesus will come to you, my friend. No matter how many paddles you have in life. No matter which table you're playing at. Jesus will come and speak to you. If you're listening. See, Peter, Peter did not realize what we know today in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.15 Jesus died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. This is all about resignation versus restoration. Some of us are resigned to live life how we want to. My friend, God has given you something greater than what you're accustomed to. There's a, a lifestyle that I wanted to live, and God took my steps that I devised in my head, and he said, boy, I'm going to direct you on a different path. Nothing that God has taken from me or I have sacrificed, nothing is greater than what he's given me. Do not be resigned to live life as you wish and as you want. And do not live in your past mistakes. Give them to Jesus. And he will restore you. He will restore you. Put the paddle down. No matter you're a sinner or a saint, trust the scriptures. If you've watched any news in the last week, did y'all hear about what happened to our American cousins up north in Baltimore? Did y'all hear, hear about all that? And we, you know, whether, we have no idea what the cause is, just yet at least. We do know that people died, properties lost. The city of Baltimore is, is going to have to pay a lot of money to re restore it or, or to build another bridge. And this is something that I did not know until Wendy and I were talking this past, past week here at church. And she said, you know, Pete, you know that happened in Brunswick back in the early 70s? And, 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 I, and we went and we looked, looked it up. On the election night, election night November 7, 1972, the Sydney Lanier Bridge had a similar accident. There, there was a ship, I think it was called the Neptune, and it ran. There was a bridge, you know how the bridge, I forgot what type of bridge that's called, you know where it come, comes up in the middle? What? It's called a what? Drawbridge. Drawbridge, thank you. Well, there were cars parked on both sides of that bridge where, where the part in the middle comes up. And there was a, a young man, probably about a senior, senior in high school, his name was Charlie Wells. He was driving his mother's brand new Cadillac. And he looks over and he sees this ship coming and it's going right for where that pillar is. And it's, he's a, that ship's about to hit us. He gets out of his car and he runs and he's yelling, get out of your car, get out of your car. Ship, bridge is going to be destroyed. It's going to sink. Get out of your car. And some people, you know what they did? They got out of their car. And that, and that ship hit. And that bridge folded and collapsed. And the first car to hit the water was that brand new white Cadillac. Boom. The other cars came. But do you know that there were some people in some cars that looked at that dude? And they said, who is this weirdo? He was tall. He was thin. He had long hair. Reports read he looked like a hip, hipster. Like a hippie. And people said, who is this crazy fool? Who's going to listen to a hippie? Yelling, get out of the car, get out of the car. Until it was too late. And some people got trapped in their cars and died. And on, later on the news, they interviewed Charlie Wells. And Charlie said, I tried my best to warn as many people as I could. I don't know what it was. Was it, was it my age? Was it the way I look with my ponytail in the back of my head? And people wouldn't listen to me? Is that what it was? Oh, how I wish people would had listened to me. They all would have stayed alive. And I thought, heard that story. I said, oh boy, that's perfect for this week. You know, some of us are playing ping pong, wrestling between our faith and our feelings, between resignation and restoration. Here we are playing, and people are dying on the way to hell. And even when we warn them, they look at us, 
He said, who are you to tell me about impending doom? When you live life the way you do. When you look the way you look. Who are you to tell me that? It's one thing to question your salvation. But my friend, how many of us are saved? But we're not doing the works of a believer. We don't even look like a Christian. You know what you need to do? Put the paddle down. Say that with me, church. Put the paddle down. No, 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 no. Put the paddle down. Father God, I thank you for this wonderful message of your truth. And Father God, you have called us to a life, a life of security, a life that's rested upon faith. Oh, Lord, our faith should not be found in our head but in our hearts. And Lord, there's so many of us. Yes, we do believe that Jesus has risen from the grave in our heads, but we've never truly been saved because our life is no different. There's no, there's, there's no evidence that we have been trans- transformed. So, Lord, as only you can do, Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit will convict, will call and choose these pe- people this day that they will not resist the Spirit but surrender. And make sure that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved. That they will put their paddle down. And they will give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's some of us, we are believers. And Lord, we're just back and forth in life. We're back and forth. We're unsteady. To and fro. Like that ball on a ping pong table. I pray that we'll put the paddle down. And we will get out of our feelings and start living in faith. Lord God, that we will give up our comforts in life and forget about the mistakes that we've made and put the paddle down and come to you Jesus and trust your scripture and know that we're forgiven and it's time for us to move on and be about your business Lord may your people respond as you would have them to in this very moment Lord we love you we thank you for this and we ask this in Christ's name Amen if you would stand please
with the Lord I'm here I'm here don't leave here go off to lunch and go photo shoot and do whatever you got to do your house do not leave till you are right with the Lord my friend your soul is much more important than wherever it is you're going we need to remember two families in need many of you know our beloved sister Linda T Carter she lost her sister this past week they have laid her sister to rest please keep that family in prayer and many of you know Michael and Sandra Lewis. Michael's mother has died after a long illness. She will be laid to rest tomorrow in Glenville. Make, make sure you check your emails later today. So please be in prayer for those two wonderful families. Baptist men is tomorrow night. We need a hand count very quickly, Bruce. If you plan on being here tomorrow night for a Baptist men, would you raise your hand? We need to have a good count. We've got a great speaker coming tomorrow night. You got it, Chief? There was one more thing I was going to say, but I have forgotten. David Lewis Paul, are you praying for us today? Don't forget, on the way out, we have a photo op over here on the right side, my right side, right behind you on this right, you know, it'll be to y'all, y'all's right as well when y'all, y'all leave. Make sure you take pictures. This is a moment in time. You parents and grandparents, don't you know how fast those kids grow up? Take some pictures. Enjoy yourself. I hope you're glad to be here today. Jesus is alive, my friend. On you, baby. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this, this day. For this is a day of hope. For our hope is with Jesus. And I thank you for him. And my prayer is simply this that each one of us, when we leave here today, we will strengthen our relationship with him. In your son's name I pray. Amen.